فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل واشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى اله واصحابه والتابعين له باحسان الى يوم الدين ما بعد We are in the explanation of the book Atibyan Fi Adabi Hamalatul Qur'an written by Al-Imam Al-Allama Al-Mujtahid Muhyiddin Abi Zakariya Yahya Ibn Sharafi Nibla Wariyyin Rahimahullah Ta'ala We finished the first four chapters and we're going to start the fifth chapter inshaAllah Ta'ala today Al-Bab Al-Khamisu في آداب حامل القرآن قد تقدم جمل منه في قد تقدم جمل منه في الباب الذي قبل هذا ومن آدابه أن يكون على أكمل الأحوال وأكرم الشمائل وأن يرفع نفسه عن كل ما نهى القرآن عنه إجلالا للقرآن وأن يكون مصونا عن دنيء الاكتساب شريف النفس مترفعا على الجبابرة والجفاة من أهل الدنيا متواضعا للصالحين وأهل الخير والمساكين ويكون متخشعا ذا سكينة ووقار فقد جاء عن عمر بن الخطاب فقد جاء عن عمر بن الخطاب رضي الله عنه أنه قال يا معشر القراء ارفعوا رؤوسكم فقد وضح لكم الطريق واستبقوا الخيرات ولا تكونوا عيالا على الناس وعن عبد الله بن مسعود رضي الله عنه قال ينبغي لحامل القران ان يعرف بليله اذا الناس نائمون وبنهاره إلى الناس مفطرون وبنهاره إلى الناس مفطرون وبحزنه إلى الناس يفرحون وببكائه إلى الناس يضحكون وبصمته إلى الناس يخوضون وبخشوعه إلى الناس يختالون وعن الحسن رحمه الله تعالى إن من كان قبلكم رأوا القرآن رسائل من ربهم فكانوا يتدبرونها بالليل وينفذونها بالنهار وعن الفضيل بن عياض رحمه الله تعالى ينبغي لحامل القرآن ألا تكون له حاجة إلى أحد من الخلفاء فمن دونهم وعنه أيضا حامل القرآن حامل راية الإسلام لا ينبغي أن يهلو مع من يهل لا ينبغي أن يلهو مع من يلهو ولا يسهو مع من يسهو ولا يلغو مع من يلغو تعظيما لحق القرآن Much has already been said regarding this topic in the preceding chapter. Among that which is required of one who has memorized the Qur'an is that he possesses the best possible qualities. This is now, inshaAllah ta'ala, the fifth chapter where the author, rahimahullah, he talks about the etiquette that it is needed from the person who's now already memorized the Qur'an. The previous chapters were speaking about the person who wants to, who wants to memorize the Qur'an and learn the Qur'an. Now he's talking about the individual who's already memorized the Qur'an, the etiquette that is needed from that person. And he mentions that some of the characteristics and the noble attributes that are needed from the person who is, uh, who is learning the Qur'an was already mentioned. So some of those characteristics also come here as well. So the ones who are learning the Qur'an, some of the attributes that were needed from them, from Minbab al-Awla, it's more befitting that it's found in the one who's carrying the Qur'an. And he says, from the etiquettes that should be found in a person is أَنْ يَكُونَ عَلَىٰ أَكْمَلِ الْأَحْوَالِ That the person of the Qur'an, he always sets himself the highest level of integrity, the highest level of nobility. He's never the minimum. 
He's a man who's carrying the Quran or she's a woman who's carrying the Quran. She's not like the ordinary people now. She, she or he is carrying themselves ala akimal al-ahwali wa akram al-shama'i. They carry themselves in the best of etiquettes, in the best of manners. Now, the best, the best, the best possible qualities, characteristics, and manners, and that he forbids himself from everything the Quran forbids. So this person also, anything that the Quran prohibits and that the Quran says it's haram, they stay away from. They don't question it. They don't doubt it. They stay away from it because that's the characteristics of a person who has the Quran with them. And some of the ulama, they say that the person who's carrying the Qur'an should not only stay away from the things that are haram, they should even stay away from the things that are disliked. The things that are what? Disliked. That you're very strict to yourself. And the things that are recommended, sunnah, you, you, you do them as though they are wajib for you. The one who's carrying the Qur'an. And the reason for this, the author says, is because... No, in, in, ver in veneration of the Quran. So the reason why you're doing all of that, the reason why you're, you're coming with the best of affairs and the best of characteristics and the best of nobility uh, is ijlal al Quran. You're honoring the Quran. Because what you have been given is a great thing. And as they say, with great uh, power comes great responsibilities. You're now carrying something very powerful. <coughs> And with this comes a lot of responsibilities and a lot of things that you need to do that ordinary people may not have to do now. He must avoid holding um, degrading jobs in, or from profiting from that which is lowly. That a person who is half of the Qur'an and the alim of the Qur'an, he should stay away from. He should stay away from having a, a low-rated, a degraded job. He shouldn't work as, uh, for instance, a rubbish man, for instance. He should not also become a, uh, uh, a milkman, for instance. Jobs that people would look down at and they wouldn't... Gr the reason is because it's not about you right now. It's really not about you. It's the fact that people are looking at the Qur'an and they're respecting the Qur'an. So you as an individual should not, he's saying, you should not place in yourself and do and come with um, jobs and, and income that is filthy. Some ulama they say no, it doesn't actually mean the job itself. To be honest, it doesn't mean the job. It just means that you shouldn't have uh, things that are very doubtful, that can make people question you. It doesn't necessarily have to be a low-rated job or not, but it encompasses both of them. Now. And he must have dignity and respect for himself at all times. The person should respect himself. If they've got the Qur'an, they should, they should be sharif and nafsi. They should have self-respect. Honor yourself. You've got the best thing that a person can ever have. You shouldn't be a person who has the Qur'an and has memorized the Qur'an and has gained the Qur'an. Ma'adhalika, you're what? You're in a state of, you know, degrading and humiliation. No. Sharif and nafs, be honorable. Now. He must raise himself above arrogant and disrespectful people who concern themselves only with this world. Well, so he should mutarafi' al al jababira. He should place himself higher. The tyrant individuals, those who have exceeded their limits, okay, those who've also become short in their affairs, who don't come with that which is obligatory on them, the people of the dunya. He shouldn't really busy himself with them. He shouldn't entertain them. Now while humbling himself before the pious, the righteous, and the needy. So the people who he is humble for are righteous people, the people of good, the people of you know, poverty, the misakeen, the ones who are Ahlul Khayr, <coughs> Ahlul Salah, the misakeen. Those are the people who he, who is that individual, the teacher, I mean, the one who's memorized the Quran, he's humble for those people. He's not humble for the the transgressors and those who have exceeded their limits and the wrongdoers and people who, who their concern is only their worldly gain. No. He must also preserve an air of humility, tranquility and dignity. So he has to be a person who's, who's got humility. Consistently his hum humility that, again we said this, that is a characteristic that the person believes. He acknowledges and he understands that every single thing which he has 
has not come to him from his own hard efforts and his own hard work. All of this is something Allah gave to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Umar ibn al-Khattab is related to have said, O recitals of the Qur'an, raise your heads in dignity, for indeed the path of truth and righteousness has become apparent to you, and compete against one another in doing good, and do not allow yourselves to depend on other people. The author, rahimahullah, he brought a statement of who? Uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Umar radiallahu anhu says, Ya ma'ashar al-Qurra. The word ma'ashar is a group. A jama'a. And it really generally means a people who are together on something. The word ma'ashar is plural is ma'ashar. And it is al-jama'a alladheena amruhum wahid. Their affairs is one. They've come together. He said, Ya ma'ashar al-qurra'i. Oh, the reciters. And the qurra, as I said, this term at the time of the pious predecessors, it didn't just mean those who memorized the Qur'an. It meant those who memorized the Qur'an and they implemented what was in it. Ya ma'ashar al-qurra, irfa'u ru'usakum. Lift your heads. Lift your, lift your heads. فَقَدْ وَضَحَ لَكُمْ لَكُمُ الطَّرِيقِ The path has become clear for you. The path has become clear for you. وَاسْتَبِقُ الْخَيْرَاتِ and hasten in good. وَلَا تَكُونُ عِيَالًا عَلَى النَّاسِ and don't be ones who are in need of the people. Don't be one who needs the people. And that your, your hunger and your need is connected to the people. Now, Abdullah ibn Masood said, He who has memorized the Quran must be distinguishable by night while others are asleep, meaning by his staying awake, praying in the late hours of the night. And by the day while others eat, meaning by his fasting and by his sadness while others are happy, and by his crying while others are laughing, and by his silence while others are chatting, and by his humility while others boast. The author here brought the statement of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. He said, يَنْبَغِي لِحَامِلُ Quran." It is needed and it should be a characteristic of the one who is carrying the Quran. And يُعْرَفَ بِلَيْلِهِ That he is known for his night. هَرَيْنْكَ The night is known. Known to do what? إِذَا النَّاسُ نَائِمُونَ when the people are sleeping, he is known for his prayer. And at the day, he is known for his fasting. When the people are eating and drinking, uh, he is known for his fasting. And he is known for his sadness, how sad he is. When the people are laughing and they are, you know, they are uh, laughing, he is what? He's sad. He's sad about his own affairs and he's also sad about the affairs of the Muslims. He's also crying when the people are laughing. And he's also known for his silence. He's quiet. He doesn't talk. When the people are indulging into speech, indulging into affairs that doesn't really concern them. He, on the other hand, is quiet. وَبِخُشُوعِهِ He's known for his humility. إِذَا النَّاسُ يَخْتَالُونَ When the people are boasting, they are speaking about, they are speaking about themselves in a very good light. Oh, this is what I do. Oh, yeah, this is me. He's known for his humility. He doesn't really mention anything about himself. Naam. Al-Hassan al-Basri once said, Those who lived before you saw the Qur'an as a set of messages from their Lord. And so they would contemplate it by night and practice it by day. Hassan al Basri said, Inna man kana qablakum, those who came before you, Ra'awul Qur'an, they saw the Quran as what? Rasa'ila mir rabbihim. They saw the Quran as message Allah sent to them. Allah sent them a letter specifically to them. Fakanu yatadabbarunaha bil layli, at day they would contemplate on it. Sorry, at night, sorry, they would be contemplating on it. And on day, and in daytime they will be executing the legislations and the rules that are in the Quran. So what were they known for? They were known for pondering on the Quran at night. And how would they ponder on it? Either by reciting it or praying at night with it. So their Qiyamul Layl, whilst they were reading the Quran, they were contemplating and pondering over it. And at daytime they were what? Every command and every prohibition and every affairs that is in the Quran, 
they were executing it at day. But what's powerful here is that he said that the way that they used to perceive the Quran was a letter sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to them. Meaning some of us read the Quran today and the way that we look at the Quran is oh, he's just telling us stories about the previous nations and he's talking to us about matters here and there. But how many, really, how many of us really take it on board and say this verse that I'm reading, where do I stand regarding it? That's when the pondering and contemplation comes. Or else the Quran for you is just a third party that it's talking about. It's got really nothing to do with you. Naam. Al Fudail ibn Ayyad said, He who has memorized the Quran must not seek anything that either rules or the subjects have to offer. That either the rulers or the subjects have to offer. He also said, He who bears the Quran, meaning memorizes it, bears the banner of Islam. It is therefore not befitting of him to waste time with those who waste time, nor to be negligent with those who are negligent, nor to engage in idle talk with those who engage in idle talk in the armor of the Qur'an. So here, here Rahimahullah brings then the statement of the noble Imam Al-Fudayr ibn Iyadir Rahimahullah Ta'ala. He says, Yanbaghi li hamil al-Qur'an. The individual who's carrying the Qur'an, it is upon him. Allah takuna lahu hajatun ila hadin. That he doesn't need anyone. من الخلفاء whether it be the leaders those in charge فمن دونهم and those who come after them وعنه أيضا أن أنصف فضيل العياض said حامل القرآن the one who's carrying the Quran is حامل راية الإسلام he's carrying the banner of الإسلام لا ينبغي أن أن يلهو مع من يلهو he should not he should not what does he say the word يلهو he should not waste time with those who waste time. So he should not in any way, form or shape waste his time and uh, sit around not doing anything with those who are wasting their time. Because you're not the same as them. What does he say? They are with those who are And he also isn't yes, um, it comes from the word sujood sahwi. This is the word that's used. But this now here means that Sahwi here, there means with forgetfulness or when you forget something. But here is when you're deliberately making yourself forget something and that's negligence. Okay. That the person is not negligent. <coughs> okay. In any way, form or shape. And he doesn't indulge in idle speech with those who do. The reason is because he honors the Quran. So there are people who just want to sit down in coffee shops. They want to sit with you in, 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 they just want to chat with you on WhatsApp every now and then. And if you really look at their situation, you tend to find that they are Ahlul Lahwi wal Laibi. People just want to joke. People just want to play. And they are people who want to just indulge in idle speech. Maybe this is their only way of, as they see it, as getting closer to the deed. And the matter of the fact for you is because you have the Quran and you need to honor the Quran, then you as an individual don't indulge in that. And you distance yourself from it. So they may even have an intent, a good intention from it. But that doesn't still justify you as an individual indulging with those type of people. Then the author, Rahimahullah, he says, فِي التَّحَدِيرِ مِنِ اتِّقَادِ الْقُرْآنِ مَعِيشَةً وَفِي حُكْمِ وَفِي حُكْمِ أَخْذِ الْأُجْرَةِ عَلَى تَعْلِيمِ ومن أهم ما يؤمر به أن يحذر كل الحذر من اتخاذ من اتخاذ القرآن معيشة يتكسب بها فقد جاء عن عبد الله فقد فقد جاء عن عبد الرحمن بن شبل رضي الله عنه قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم اقرأوا القرآن ولا تأكلوا به ولا تجفوا عنه ولا تغلوا فيه وعن جابر بن عبد الله رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال اقرأوا القرآن قبل أن يأتي قوم يقيمونه إقامة القدح يتعجلونه ولا يتأجلونه رواه أبو داود بمعناه من رواية سهل بن سعد معناه يتعجلون أجره إما بمال وإما بسمعة ونحوها وعن فضيل بن عمر رحمه الله تعالى قال دخل رجلان من أصحاب النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم مسجدا 
فلما سلم الإمام قام رجل فتلا آيات من القرآن ثم سأل فقال أحدهما إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول سيجيء قوم يسألون بالقرآن فمن سأل بالقرآن فلا تعطوه وهذا الإسناد منقطع فإن فضيل بن عمر لم يسمع الصحابة وأما أخذ الأجرة على تعليم القرآن فقد اختلف العلماء فيه فحكى الإمام أبو سليمان الخطابي من أخذ الأجرة عليه عن جماعة من العلماء منهم الزهري وأبو حنيفة وعن جماعة أنه يجوز إذا لم يشترطه إذا لم يشرطه You can say both ways وهو قول الحسن البصري والشعبي وابن سيرين وذهب عطاء ومالك والشافعي وآخرون إلى جوازها إذا شارطه واستاجره إجارة صحيحة وقال وقد وقد جاء بالجواز الأحاديث الصحيحة واحتج من منعها بحديث عبادة بن صامت أنه علم رجلا من أهل الصفة القرآن فأهدى له قوسا فقال له النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إن إن سرك أن تطوق بها طوقا من نار فأقبلها وهو حديث مشهور رواه أبو داود وغيره وبآثار كثيرة عن السلف وأجاب المجوزون عن حديث عبادة بن صامت بجوابين أحدهما أن في إسناده مقالا والثاني أنه كان تبرع بتعليمه فلم يستحق شيئا أهدي إليه فلم يستحق شيئا أهدي إليه على سبيل العوض فلم يجز له الأد فلم يجز له الأخذ بخلاف من يعقد معه إجارة قبل التعليم والله أعلم Among the things that recites must avoid is making a living off the Qur'an. Abdul Rahman ibn Shibat once said, Recite the Qur'an and do not profit from it, meaning material profit, nor neglect it, nor go to extremes in dealing with it. The author, rahimahullah, here, Faslun, he brings a chapter في التحذين من اتخاذ القرآن معيشة Making income and money from, from the Qur'an وفي حكم الأخ وفي حكم أخذ الأجرة على تعليمه and what's the ruling in taking a salary on the Quran he says ومن أهم ما يؤمر به from the greatest things that are commanded is أن يحذر كل الحذري that the person stays far from بالاتخاذ القرآن معيشة that the person stays away from trying to gain a living from the Quran يتكسب بها and he makes money and income from فقد جاء it has come and Abdul Rahman ibn Shibrin radiyallahu ta'ala anhu that he said that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said اقرأوا القرآن read and recite the Quran ولا تأكلوا به and don't eat from the income that you make from the Quran ولا تجفوا عنه ولا ولا تغلوا فيه and don't become negligent nor become extreme in exaggeration regarding the Quran. So the hadith here, what, he uses, what he's using from it is وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا بِهِ Don't try to make a living out of the Quran and try to make money from it. So this is the, the first thing which the author starts with, which is the view of those who say that it's not permissible to make money, that it's not permissible to make money uh, from the recitation of the Quran. So he brings the hadith of Abdul Rahman ibn Shibrin radiallahu anhu. Naam. Jabir, Jabir radiallahu anhu said the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said recite the Quran before there comes a people who treat the Quran as one would treat an Arab 
They hasten it and are not patient with it. Abu Dawood narrated this with its meaning from the narration of Sahan ibn Sa'ad. The meaning of the hadith is that the reciters hasten to earn the reward either by seeking wealth, fame, etc., rather than wait for their reward in the hereafter. The author now brings the statement of Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu anhu, in which he said, I heard the Prophet say, Iqra'ul Quran and read the Quran. Recite it. Before what? Qabla an yatiya qawmun yuqimunahu iqamat al qidhi. Before there comes those who will establish its recitation. They will come with its recitation. The word qidhi is basically the arrow. The arrow when it flies, when you throw the arrow, what happens? There is little wings that they make for it which balances the arrow when it flies, it doesn't go all over the place, it goes straight to the direct direction. صح? So there are those people who are going to read the Qur'an before it's fully complete. يَتَعَجَّلُونَهُ وَلَا يَتَعَجَّلُونَ They will hasten. يَتَعَجَّلُونَهُ means they hasten. Hasten in what though? Hasten in attaining reward for in this world. Or even fame and respect and recognition. That's what they want from this. So they hasten, meaning they should have waited for all of that in the hereafter, right? If you wanted reward, they should have waited for it the hereafter. But what these people are doing is that they are hastening for the reward in this world. So this hadith, Abu Dawood narrated in its meaning, the riwayat al-Sahal ibn Sa'ad al-Sa'idi radiyallahu ta'ala anhu. Naam. Hudayr ibn Amr radiyallahu anhu once said, Two of the Prophet's companions وسلم, entered a mosque. And when the Imam finished the prayer, a man stood up, began to recite the Quran, and then begged for money. One of the two companions said to the other, To Allah we belong, and to Him is our return. This is something typically said when one sees or hears something distressing. I heard the Messenger of Allah وسلم, say, There will come a people who will use the Quran to beg. And so do not give anything to those who use the Qur'an to beg. The author, rahimahullah, brings the story of Fudayl ibn Amr, rahimahullah, who said, دَقَلَ رَجُلَانِ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ النَّمِي صلى الله عليه وسلم مَسْجِدًا That two companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they entered the masjid, فَلَمَّا سَلَّمَ الْإِمَامُ When the Imam said, سَلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ قَامَ رَجُلٌ A man, a random man, stood up in the midst of the people. فَتَلَ آيَاتٍ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ So he just recite, he started just to recite uh, verses from the Qur'an. He started to recite verses from the Qur'an. And you tend to find this characteristic common in Egypt right now. You find that they sit in the uh, ground and the uh, floor and they just recite Qur'an. The reason why they're doing that is what they want through, your, through the recitation is that you give them money. So they'll sit on the road and they'll be reciting Qur'an. You see, especially if you go to Jama'at al-Azhar and those areas, there's a little tunnel that you go under when you want to cross the road from one side. There's one side is called Masjid Hussein. You see? And the other side is actually the Jama'at, Jama'at al-Azhar. The tunnel that you walk in, that bottom tunnel that you go under, you find this one or two would sit there, generally. And what he will do is he will recite Quran there. Very strong, powerfully. So you recognize he's there. And he sits there and he's got a little uh, pouch or something next to him. And you just throw coins in there or whatever you have. So what he's trying to do is he's trying to attain through his recitation. He wants to gain through his recitation. What? Money. That's what he wants. So this is something like that that happened in the time of these two noble companions. Two men, uh, two companions came into the Prophet's, uh, they came into a masjid. And then when the Imam said, Salaam alaikum, Salaam alaikum, a man just randomly stood up. And he just started to recite verses from the Quran. And then he asked the people for money. And then one of them, uh, from the two companions, one of them said, Inna lillahi from Allah we have come, wa inna ilayhi raja'un, and to him we will return. I heard the Prophet sallallahu say, Sayaji'u qawmun, that there will come a group of people. Yas'aluna bil Qur'ani, they will be asking the people by their recitation of the Quran. فَمَنْ سَأَلَ بِالْقُرْآنِ If anyone who comes and asks you through the Qur'an, فَلَا تُعْطُوهُ Don't give him anything. And the author then says, وَهَذَا الْإِسْنَادُ مُنْقَطِعُ This chain of narration is disconnected 
فإن فضيل بن عمر لم يسمع الصحابة فضيل بن عمر he never he never heard from the companions so he's from the he's from the صغار تابعين or some scholars said that he's not even a tabi he's a tabi tabi he only met the students of the companions so according to Nawawi he's not even a even from the صغار تابعين نعم the chain of narration in this hadith is broken for they and Amr did not hear anything from the companions. With regards to being paid to teach the Quran, the scholars have differed and have different opinions. Here we, the Shaykh, he mentions some issues, which is the person asking, pay attention. So far, what he's spoken about is you want to get money for recitation of the Quran. You recite the Quran and you want people to give you money for that. This is something that the Shaykh Rahimullah already spoke about, that he doesn't see it to be permissible. But what's the, what's the ruling if a person teaches a person? It's not that he recites for you, it's not that he reads, but he teaches you the Quran and he educates you regarding the Quran. What's the ruling in taking money on the Quran? So he says, the scholars, they differed regarding it. Now there's a point I need to really mention, my beloved brothers and sisters. And that is, when the scholars differ on a matter, it's not a proof. Many people say to you, you say to them, what's the ruling on this issue? They say to you, اختلف العلماء. Like he's giving you an evidence. اختلف العلماء means that the scholars differed. If the scholars differs, it makes it even more of a priority that we take it back to the Kitab and the Sunnah. And it's not a proof. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi says that the only, the only person who would use the difference of the scholars as a proof is the ignorant one. Ibn Taymi says that. And I think something like that Ibn al-Qayyim says in his I'lam al waqiin That the only person who would use khilaf al-ulama, the differences of the scholars in a matter as a proof, are the ignorant ones. Because Allah said to us in the Quran, فَإِن تَنَازَعَتُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ فَرُدُّهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ If the scholars differ amongst themselves in an opinion or in a matter, take it back to the what? The Quran and the, and the Sunnah. And as we always say, the people who take it to the Quran and the Sunnah are those who can. Qurtubi mentions that, by the way, in that tafsir of that qawl, in the ayah, sorry. Qurtubi mentions that the ayah is not talking to the Amatul Nas. The general mass can't take it back to the Quran and the Sunnah. They'll bring about corruption and harm to tell them to go to the Quran and Sunnah and extract a ruling from it. The ayah is talking to the people who have knowledge. But saying that there's a difference of opinion doesn't justify or doesn't is not an answer for a for the matter at hand. It causes more of a confusion to say that there's a difference of opinion. Allah says in another ayah. وَمَا اخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِيهِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَحُكْمُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ That you never differ amongst yourselves in a matter except its ruling with, is with who? Is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this concept of فَقَدْ اخْتَلَفَ الْعُلَمَاءِ فِيهِ And they're leaving it like that saying oh the scholars differ and you just leave it like that. Like you've given a delil and an evidence. is incorrect. But what is right is that you could say فَقَدْ اخْتَلَفَ الْعُلَمَاءِ this group they use this evidence and the other group they use this evidence and the strongest opinion for me that I am inclined to is this and you leave the person with that does that make sense? Naam. Imam Abu Sulaiman al-Khattabi mentioned that a group of scholars were of the opinion that taking payment for teaching the Quran was prohibited among such scholars are Zuhri and Abu Hanifa. The author now he brings the statement of Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi. Al Imam Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi. Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi is basically the word al Khattabi is mansubun ila jaddihi. It's attributing him to his grandfather. I'm one of his grandfathers. Yeah, ila jaddin min ajdadi. One of his grandfathers whose name was Khattab. Um, his name, his actual name, Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi, is Hamd ibn Muhammad ibn Ibrahim ibn al Khattab. And some scholars they said it's not Hamd, rather his name is Ahmed. So there is a difference. 
He's got a sharh on Sunan Abi Dawood. He has a sharh on what? Sunan Abi Dawood. Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi has a sharh on Sunan Abi Dawood. He, Al Imam al Nawawi says that, that Al Imam Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi mana'a akhd al ujrati alayhi jama'atun that Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi transmitted and brought forward a group of scholars who were of the opinion that it's prohibited, that it's not allowed to take reward or to take money in the teaching of the Qur'an. And from those scholars are al Zuhriyu, whose name is Abu Bakr, Muhammad ibn Muslim, Ibn Ubaidullah, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Shihab, Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Harith, Ibn Zuhra, Ibn Kilab, Ibn Murrah, Ibn Ka'ab, Ibn Lu'ay, Ibn Fihr, Ibn Ghalib. He enters the Prophet's tribe from there. And Abu Hanifa, Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, is also from the scholars who held the opinion that it is impermissible to take money in teaching the Quran. Now. Others have expressed the opinion that it is permissible to teach for a wage provided that payment is not stipulated as a condition for teaching. This is the opinion of Al Hassan al Basri, Al Sha'bi, and Ibn Salim. Here now the author brings a second opinion which is called the middle path. From the two, three, there's three opinions. This is the middle path. The first one was that it's not allowed unrestrictedly. Khalas. Zuhri and Abu Hanifa were saying that it's not allowed. Qat whatsoever. But then Hassan al Basri, and you can say Basri if you wish to, you can say Bisri if you want. Bikasri al Ba'i or Bifat al Ba'i, they're both the same. Both ways, Bifat al Ba'i wa Kasriha is correct. You can say Basriyu or you can say Bisriyu. Hassan al Basri said, Rahimahullah and Sha'bi. Sha'bi, his name is Amir ibn Sharahil. Ibn Sharahil, Rahimahullah, he held the opinion, and Muhammad ibn Sirin, they held the opinion that it's can, that is permissible as long as he doesn't make it a condition. So their opinion is that it is permissible with a restriction, with a condition. That condition is that he doesn't condition when he's teaching. So he doesn't say, I'm going to teach you guys with this condition. He's not allowed to do that. Okay? This is now, then he's now he's going to mention the third opinion, the third group. Hatta Malik Imam Shafi'i and other scholars are of the opinion that it is permissible to stipulate payment provided the agreement meets all the conditions of a led legitimate rent contract. The Here the author, Rahimullah, he now brings the opinion of Ata and Malik ibn Anas and an Imam al-Shafi'i, Rahimahumullah jami'an. They were of the opinion that it's permissible even if it conditions. So they are of the opposite opinion of who? Al Imam Zuhri and Abu Hanifa. They are saying that it's permissible unrestrictedly. And they came with many evidences to, to uh, push their argument. And all of this is, brothers and sisters, this is all Noah we're transmitting it from Alim al Sunan, by the way, which is a Sharah Sunan Abi Dawood by Abu Sulaiman al Khattabi. Naam. There are many authentic hadiths that suggest that taking payment for teaching the Qur'an is permissible. And those who see it as permissible use an evidence, the hadith of Ubada ibn Samid, a companion who taught the Qur'an to a man from the people of As-Suffa, poor, poor, poor migrants who came to a settle in a place called As-Suffa in Medina. The man then gave him a bow as a gift, and when Ubada took the bow to the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet said, if it pleases you that you should be punished with a collar of fire around your neck for accepting this gift, then accept it. This hadith is a popular hadith narrated by Abu Dawood and others. This now is the hadith of Ubadat ibn Samit that a man from the people of Sufa, he taught the Quran. فَأَهْدَ لَهُ قَوْسَ And they gave him a qawse. A qawse here is what? A bow. Some of the narrations mention it was Ubay, was the one who taught the Quran. 
فَادَلَهُ قَوْسَ They gave him a bow as a gift. Then the Prophet ﷺ, he what? He said to him, إِنْ إِنْ سَرَّكَ أَنْ تُطَوَّقَ بِهَا طَوْكًا مِنْ نَارٍ فَأَقْبِلْهَا أَمَّا فَأَقْبَلْهَا وَهُوَ حَدِيثُ مَشْهُورٍ That if it pleases you, أَنْ تُطَوَّقَ What does he say? تَطَوَّق means in English? Punish with a collar of fire around the neck. This, it translates it. نعم. ولذلك الله سيد القرآن من أخذ حديث الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم من أخذ أرضا anybody who takes a land that's not his توقه الله سبع على الأراضين the seven earths will be dragged on his neck the day of judgment he will be dragging it and some of the narrations mention قيد شبر so the word توقه means when something is connected to your neck and you're told to drag it but he will be told and تطوق بها طوقا من نار so this bow would be turned into a collar, bow, a collar on his neck and it would be t- and it's from the fire Jahannam would, would be made out of Jahannam and he would be told to wear it uh, so the Prophet said, is asking him do you, does this please you to do this so the Sahabi went and he gave it back so this hadith is the strongest evidence that's brought forward the, I mean the strongest evidence that they bring forward Naam. Those holding the view that teaching the Quran for a wage is permissible respond to what this hadith entails in two ways. First, that the soundness of its chain of narration is questionable. And secondly, that Ubada had initially intended to teach without compensation and was therefore not supposed to accept any kind of reward. This is considered different to the situation of two people who agreed on compensation beforehand. So here, وَأَجَابَ الْمُجَوِّزُونَ عَنْ حَدِيثُ عُبَادَةَ بِجَوَابَيْنِ The scholars, they responded to this hadith. This hadith of Ubadah ibn Samit. They gave two responses. The first response, they said, أَنَّ فِي إِسْنَادِهِ مَقَالًا That this narration, there's a question on its authenticity. Is it even authentic? They questioned that. And they opened the doubt on that. The second response that which they gave, which is, أَنَّوْ كَانَ تَبَرَّعَ بِتَعْلِيمِهِ That initially, he said that he was going to teach for the sake of Allah and that he wasn't he didn't condition anything and he said this is tabarru tabarru means what something you're not going to charge what does it say in english uh, compensation ah compensation Naam. i don't know if your compensation is the best word but it means that when you say i'm going to tabarru is when somebody gives a you know in you, you tend to find it used a lot when a person donates an organ it's tabarru when you donate something the point here is that he basically said that he's going to teach for free. فَلَمْ يَسْتَحِقَّ شَيْئًا أُهْدِيَ إِلَيْهِ عَلَى سَبِيلِ الْعِوَضِ That now he doesn't deserve to be given something in response or return for what he's initially said that he was going to do for the, first, for the sake of Allah. That's the second response they gave. So the first response was أَنَّ فِي إِسْنَادِهِ مَقَالَ That there's a question in the authenticity of this particular hadith. And the second one was أنه تكاد تبرع بتعليمه ده تبرع في التعليم في البداية، so he doesn't now deserve to get a gift for something which he initially agreed to give it in regards to التبرع.